Dina. And I'm Charlotte. Welcome to the Grim Curriculum Extra Credit. How the heck are you? I am doing absolutely fabulous. We are recording this on July 2nd, Sunday, and it's been another rainy Sunday all day, and I have been living my best life. I cleaned my entire house this morning, and then I was exhausted, and uh, yeah, it's been a good day. That is a good day, isn't it? That's how, how you know you? like, when you're getting older, when days like that are good. I you know. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say I planned because it's a long weekend and I actually have vacation from my day job this week. Um, I was like, Monday is the day that I'm going to do my deep clean. I've been putting it off. And then the fucking spirit hit me today. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do it today because otherwise I won't feel like doing it tomorrow. You got to do it when when your mind is finally letting mm -hmm. you, you know. Yeah. But yeah, no, I'm doing really well. I, I got to play some Tears of the Kingdom today, which I know we talk about this every extra credit <laughs> episode, um, but I haven't had a lot of free time to play it. So I've been playing it and I've been enjoying it. And I also have uh, Sophie the cat, who is apparently very affectionate and needy. So I'm sure <laughs> she's going to be chiming in here and there. But uh, yeah, it's a good day. I'm excited for our topics today. Yes, I am too. We're kind of going, I think, with a mostly nautical theme again, um, which is just pure coincidence, honestly. Yeah, but I kind of like it. I'm into it. So uh, why don't we dive right in? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, okay, so I feel like we can't not have an extra credit episode and not talk about this massive crazy thing that just yeah. happened, especially based on the fact we covered the main topic of it not that long ago. So here's the thing about this. Um, our Titanic series, our th part three, we've talked about this. Um, <laughs> I openly said how badly I wanted to do this thing. Yeah, but that and, was before we knew what we know now. <laughs> right? Oh my god. And you know what? I was looking at it and the exact dive that I was looking at was this one. Not that I would have ever had the money to do anything like this, but it's one of those times where I'm like, kind of glad I'm not rich. Yeah. Oh my god. I... I even said that I wanted to come on the research vessel at the very least also. But holy cow, what a freaking mess. All right, so let's talk about it. I'm sure all of you know this by now, but we figured now that we seem to have more of the details, it's a good time to just like break it all down. I'm doing the worst puns and that one actually wasn't intentional. <laughs> oh no. I mean, we've all seen the memes out there. Oh my goodness. Okay, so on June 18th, Titan, owned by Ocean Gate, disappeared during an expedition to view the wreck of the Titanic. On board were five people, the CEO of Ocean Gate, a sea explorer, a British billionaire, and a Pakistani British billionaire and his son. And they lost communication an hour and 45 minutes into the dive. One thing that I didn't realize was that they had a bunch of loss of contact issues during their test runs and a bunch of other tour dives. So yeah. originally, yeah, like when they lost contact, they weren't too concerned. No, they're like, this it actually happened. didn't come back. Yeah, this has happened before. It's fine. It always does that. And it's like, yeah, that's what I used to say about my fucking old grand am when things would happen. <laughs> like, right? Oh, yeah. It does that all the time. Don't worry about it. We're finding out all of this stuff about the way that this thing was built. I'm sure by now we've all seen photos of the controller that was used to steer this thing. <laughs> oh, yes. What the fuck? Like, guys, I'm not a rocket scientist or anything by any means. I'm certainly not an engineer. But it was like the more you read about it, the more information that came out, it got stupider and stupider, honestly. Seriously. And it's all just so sad. I, You know, I see people making fun of them a lot. And I mean, uh, okay. But... At the end of the day, these are people. It is sad. And this one kind of hits home because, again, not that I would ever be rich enough to get to do shit like this realistically, but I can see why they wanted to do this. 
I I don't blame them for wanting to go and explore by any means. I guess some of them must have just been either willfully ignorant or just really not aware of what it, they were getting themselves into. Sometimes there's such a thing as putting too much trust into other people. Like, I feel like maybe you shouldn't do this. There's so many little stories that are coming out of this, like the stepson of Hamish Harding. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess this guy was tweeting about um, going to a Blink-182 concert while his stepdad was missing. <laughs> and then he was openly flirting with an OnlyFans model while they were, like, doing this whole search. Oh, my goodness. The itch, that's just really messy is what that is. <laughs> I can't even imagine those uncomfortable family dinners, both before and after they found no, out that he's gone. Because I think at this point, the people that I really feel for are their families. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are left behind to deal with this absolutely tragic situation and say what you will about billionaires. We've all seen the memes. It's fine. I don't think they really expected it. And for some, I think it might've been a smidge of arrogance where it clouds the judgment. And I can also really understand wanting to experience this so bad that you're willing to ignore the red flags also. Well, especially because the waiver that they had to sign multiple times talked about, hey, listen, you might die while we do this. So just a heads up. But th I mean, that's also the same kind of waiver you sign when you go zip lining. <laughs> so <laughs> that is actually very true. That's a it's... very, very valid point. Because you don't think that the worst case scenario is going to happen to you. No, it's it's. And I feel like with this thing, it was only a matter of time. If it hadn't happened on this particular expedition, would it have happened on the next one? Like, it seemed, um, one of the things that I read about it was that it was made from, or parts of it were made from carbon fiber, mm -hmm. and which apparently is wonderful for the stretchability of a material, but not great for the compression uh, of a certain type of material and when you're going down that deep and the pressure is that high carbon fiber is not going to cut it and it's like guys you should have known this surely right and I mean also it, the, the way that it was made apparently it would have been doomed to become more and more vulnerable every single time it went under yeah, because you're going to fatigue, you know, those little tiny microscopic cracks and fractures are probably going to start to occur the more you're going up and down, right? So, oh my goodness. It's, I mean, it's it's all just sad. It, I, I feel like, do we stop going down there? That's, I, that's kind of the thing I see a lot of people asking. And time is running out, and I've talked about this a lot during our Titanic series, so I can see why... Folks want to get down there, but maybe we put a little bit more effort into the vessels that we use to go down there. Yeah. And also consider this, like when the Edmonton, Edmonton, the Edmund, Edmund Fitzgerald went down um, and the 29 crew members all perished, they just consider that now legally, it's like a, it's considered a graveyard and you're not allowed to just go diving down there and, and because those people have been laid to rest there, essentially, because they're not retrievable. So maybe it's come to a point now where we do this with the Titanic, you know, like consider it a graveyard, consider it uh, this momentous piece of history, but let's leave it alone. And also, if we want to see it, we can see it in VR. 100%. There's immaculate YouTube videos that you can watch with the footage and everything, guys. Like... Is it? I don't think it's worth dying over because a lot of people have already died for it and now five more. You know what I mean? Oh, exactly. The Titanic just keeps taking more and more victims. And I mean, I think there's something to that. You know, it brings up a lot of things like about we talked about the curse of the Titanic and this and mm -hmm. that. And maybe we just stay away for a little bit. Yeah, but absolutely. Here's something I've been hearing a lot about that's been interesting me is we've been seeing a lot of conspiracy theories coming out when it comes to this whole thing. Oh, of course, because with anything, an event of this size that kind of 
goes around the entire world, there's going to be conspiracy theories. Oh, exactly. But here's the one that keeps bugging me, and I'd love to know your thoughts. But Mm -hmm. if you guys want to read about the more wacky and wild conspiracy theories, definitely check them out. But this is just the one thing that I'm questioning is I've been seeing that the Navy was aware of the implosion very early on. They had detected it. They heard it. They were aware. So if that is true, which if I'm wrong here, someone please correct me. But what I've read says that this is true. If that is true, why did they allow an almost three day search to happen? Because we're we're, we're bringing in multiple, multiple ships from other countries, which is very expensive to do. Oh, yeah. So the amount of money that it costs just to have this whole search expedition happening, if they already knew, then why did they search? Like that, that's kind of what I don't get. There's a lot of questions and I'm hoping that we get some answers with all of this in the next few months, but I don't know. I don't know. She's a fishy one. I I made another pun. Well, Uh, I mean, it may very well be that people in the know at the time during the search already knew that the likelihood was that they hadn't made it, but they had to keep searching to a point. And it wasn't until after those three days that they're like, well, the the oxygen has run out. You know, if they had, what's the word, reemerged, we probably would have found them by now. So now we have to start looking for the pieces kind of thing. Oh, for but- sure. And I'm going to add one more, if you don't mind. Of course. If they're saying that it imploded so quickly what were all the banging noises that people heard okay so that was one that i that was a question i had too because allegedly um when they were listening to the banging it was knocking out sos in morse code now some people say well you hear what you want to hear it might have been morse code but it might have been a coincidence also but yeah i definitely had that question in mind also it, the whole thing is so weird. And I'm sure you guys that are listening, you're thinking the same thing. But I'm hoping we have more information that's going to come out in the next little bit. It's it's confusing. It's strange. And it is definitely a worst case scenario that can happen. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure as there's going to be a massive investigation and we'll start to hear more as things start popping up, you know. And we'll keep you guys posted. Yeah, of course. To segue into a... Pretty bad case scenario, but obviously not the worst case scenario. I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole the other day, and this story comes from February 15th, 2013, and the ship is called Carnival Sunrise. At the time of this event that I'm about to tell you about, it was called Carnival Triumph. It was a 102,000 ton boat about the length of three football fields housing just about 3,000 passengers and 1,100 crew. (laughs) Basically, it became uh, known to media as the poop cruise after they were stranded for five days in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, so a four-day trip became an eight-day one, and it was immediately not a good time. On February 10th, 2013, at 5.30 in the morning, the ship suffered a fire in the engine room, or one of the engine rooms, and although the fire was automatically extinguished, and there was no injuries or anything, it did result in a loss of power and a loss of propulsion. So they were just floating in the Gulf of Mexico, just a big cruise ship. So a little town on water, basically. Oh my goodness. Because there was no power, the toilets and the sewage immediately just like backed up and got out of control. So hence the poop crew's name. Oh. Yeah. No running water. It backed up in the cabin showers. It was only supposed to be a four-day cruise that rapidly became an eight-day cruise. And so... They were running out of food. (laughs) Oh, my God. Too much poop and not enough food. Yeah. Um, One of the quotes that I found say, uh, hallways were flooded with human waste. There was no AC or running water and passengers were left to survive on limited food and water. Oh, my goodness. Have you ever been on a cruise? 
No, I haven't. And honestly, I'm not about it. <laughs> no, I don't think I could do it. I've read way too many like bad stories about that. I think we we actually might have talked about it when we talked about the Titanic, but the yeah. only ones I'm interested in are the like river cruises on like the Danube or the Nile. Yeah. That I would do. But I wouldn't I'm not really about the like three thousand people at a time on just like a giant floating mall basically oh my god seriously like some of them you have like seven pools and like a zoo and shit like i don't know but like it just seems terrible like it just seems like a lot of people i just read something the other day about um this new massive cruise ship that's either being made or has just been finished and it literally has the biggest water park on a ship on it like it's already broken records and oh it's like God. absolutely massive and i think it said it was set to sail in 2024 so they must be just finishing it i think but it's like no thank you no thank you it just doesn't appeal to me no so in the case of this floating poop cruise finally uh they sent tugboats out to them to slowly tug them back to the shore They were supposed to go to New Orleans, but they ended up going to Mobile, Alabama instead. And basically, they got to port. Everything was fine. And the company had to cover all their travel expenses home. And then they gave each passenger $500 in compensation. And I don't know if that's enough. (laughs) I don't think that it, I, that would, okay. Cause I picture like how quickly would that descend into absolute and total insanity? Oh my God. I can't even imagine, like you remember when COVID first kicked off and all those people were stuck on cruise ships and they were unable to come to shore. Yes. Um, at least they were, I guess, able to come into port, whereas this was just floating. And then I think there was someone needed to get home for like critical dialysis and so another cruise ship was able to like pick them up on the side but they couldn't take on anybody else and then another cruise ship en route dropped off some food and supplies but that was really it oh yeah honest I just don't have the desire to get on one no I don't like people that much and I don't like the idea of being in close proximity to all that I mean I yeah it's a lot no I don't you. you can't leave That's the thing, right? That's what gets me. And that's what makes me not want to do it is I know that if I really hated it, that doesn't matter. You can't leave and you can't hide from the cruise. No. And you know what? A lot of people do love a cruise. Like I have relatives and friends. They fucking love a cruise because you're it's, you know, all taken care of from your breakfast to your entertainment to your shopping, like whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So I can see that being appealing for other people, but not for me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I feel it. Especially if there is poop involved. Yeah. No, thank you. That's I feel like if there's like different levels of hell, that, that has to be one of them. Oh my god, trapped on a cruise full of shit. Yeah, that uh, is definitely a layer of hell. Has to be. All right, so from that to again, we're doing a nautical theme and uh, shit's going down out there, you guys. Mm-hmm. I think Mother Nature has had enough, to be honest I, with I you. I think she has. So you may have heard about this, but it's kind of crazy. For weeks, we have been watching orcas attacking boats off the coast of Spain and Portugal and now a few other places. I'm kind of here for it. (laughs) So here's the thing about it is at first they were just like, okay, the orcas are attacking these boats. They're, you know, they're in the way. They're getting mad at them, whatever. And then what are you guys doing back there? I'm so <laughs> sorry. Like, they are... This is a long pause. It's gonna be good. <laughs> I'm sorry. They just like I one of them just like shot out, and then the other one shot out, and they're both way too old to be doing that shit. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Sorry. Where was no, I? No, you're good. You're good. What we're noticing though, that's starting to seem a little strange, is that they seem to know what they're doing. Yeah, I've heard that there's one that's kind of teaching the others. 
Yes, exactly. And I mean, we know orcas are incredibly intelligent creatures, so mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily surprise me to, to hear that they're learning this quickly, but they're learning how to damage the boats better. They specifically will like attack the uh, rudder so that the boat loses all ability to steer, right? So then they are just kind of floating. If you have a true like sailboat, you can somewhat steer, obviously, basing... Uh, using your sails but yeah they're attacking the rudders so one of the theories about why this is happening is possible revenge so (laughs) (laughs) there which okay i'm kind of here for this version sadly this does start with an orca getting injured by a boat apparently what happened is she became obsessed with getting revenge on boats and so she started to attack them and then she started teaching other orcas how to do it it could be either a an orca that's teaching a community or one that's teaching her children they're not quite sure what it is but this this is one of them but the question is why they're saying if if the orcas actually wanted to get revenge on the boats they would flat out just destroy them but they're not they're just kind of being dicks well we know that dolphins are very um mischievous shall we say and orcas are certainly in that same intelligence category they even say stuff like when orcas are in a pack hunting for seals and penguins and stuff like that if there's say a seal on an ice floe that they can't get to They'll like make this big show of like, oh, we're frustrated, we're giving up, we're all turning around, and then they'll leave, and then the seal is lured into a false sense of security, and there'll be one orca left waiting behind to get it. Like, they work together. That's horrifying. Right? They could so easily take us over if they wanted to. (laughs) But that's not the point of this episode. We're not going into that. Honestly, I'm thinking about an episode of The Simpsons where the dolphins took over and we all know how Simpsons tend to predict the future. <laughs> it's so true. And this is not, um, I mean, it's obviously a more modern sort of take on the story. But for those of you fam- familiar with Moby Dick, like the story of the white whale, right? That's based on a very true story called The Heart of the Sea, where a a whale sunk a ship and it was, you know, back in the days of whaling ships. So we're going back a ways, but not the first time a whale has sunk a ship. That's for sure. Right. And again, I'm going back to like, they're being dicks about it. So apparently what they're doing is they'll attack the rudder. And then once they realize that the boat can no longer go anywhere, they just leave. (laughs) They're just like, yep, you're fucked. Bye. They're just vandals. They are. And again, I kind of like it. Like, no one's gotten hurt, which is good. Yes, I I wouldn't want to see anyone getting hurt because I don't want them to turn around and being like, okay, orca hunt, which I'm pretty sure is not allowed, but you never know. Right. Now, I guess researchers are saying that this is possibly what they're calling a behavioral fad. Oh, Um, it's a trend. It's just a phase, mom. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. So apparently, it's just something new that they're doing right now. But you know, it's not a huge deal. They're going to get over it. Okay, interesting. I'm, I wait with bated breath to see if they actually do give up or if this is going to become an ongoing problem. And we're going to have to change like rudder technology on boats to keep the orcas away. Orca proof rudders. Oh my goodness. Well, there's your million dollar business idea if you need it. Perfect. You guys can take it. Give us like <laughs> give us 1%. We'll take the one. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man. Okay, so to kind of wrap up our nautical odyssey, I suppose, this week, (laughs) I saw this posted a little earlier in the month. Uh, This particular article from CBC News uh, was posted June 15th, and a couple was seen camping, and you might think this is not unusual for June. Mm -hmm. Well, they were on top of an iceberg just outside of Twillingate, Newfoundland. And there's pictures, they have a little tent and their paddle boards, and they seem to have set up shop on top of the iceberg. What are you doing, people? Dude, it might seem innocuous at first, but icebergs are incredibly dangerous. Not just of giant ships called the Titanic, but they can, they're not 
what I'm trying to say is they're all very uniquely shaped, I think. And they can flip and turn and shear off at any time. Even just being near them, say in a kayak in the water, can be very dangerous because it creates a massive wave when they drop apart, right? So like these guys were basically on top of a potential ticking time bomb. Right? I don't see something like that and think to myself, like, you know what I could do on that sleepover? Yeah, no thank you. Now, to be fair, this iceberg is relatively flat from what it seems like in the images, but it doesn't also look that easy to climb onto from the water, so they must have really wanted to be on it. Well, if you look at the photos of them on the iceberg kind of zoomed out, like, this thing is freaking huge. Yes, it is massive. At this particular time, the couple had not been identified, I mean, that's one hell of a first date. Yeah, they seem to have vanished from the berg without a trace, it says. The local Coast Guard and a town official both told CBC News that the campers have not returned. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't think they're coming back. But yeah, Twillingate, Newfoundland is, it's kind of known as Iceberg Alley. They all come down in the summer. I think a good friend of mine uh, out in Newfoundland he was telling me that there's a brewery that specifically uses like the ice or the water from icebergs to make their beer. What? Oh my God, yeah. that sounds amazing. Very, very um, like niche, that's for sure. I'm sure there's not too many people that can say they've drank iceberg beer. Right? Yeah. I want iceberg beer. <laughs> Someone find me iceberg beer. I'm sure we can find it. Right? Um, the moral of this story is please don't camp on the icebergs, children. <laughs> Yeah, don't. I didn't think we had to have this talk, but I guess we do. No, leave the icebergs alone. Um, I was saying to Dina off mic just before, there's people that, for the purpose of studying icebergs, they'll like dive in and then come up inside the caves that are kind of created within the iceberg in the ice. And it's incredibly dangerous because, like I mentioned, they can flip or turn and fill with water. And the idea of that, just no thank you. Absolutely not. It's like those people that do like crazy ass cave diving. Oh, even that. That's don't. I'm all for thrill seeking guys, but uh, I don't know. That's too much. That's not quite... the thing is, if you if you die skydiving, you just crater in. Chances are you're dead on the ground, right? Yeah. In a situation like that where you're running out of oxygen, the thought it it honestly makes it feel like it's difficult to breathe now here in my office. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty terrible way to die. And speaking of terrible (laughs) ways to die, that brings us to, thank you, thank you, (laughs) uh, our latest strange and unusual death. Are we ready for this? I'm so ready. Today's death is a much more recent one than the last bunch that we've done. This one brings us to July 13th, 2013. So just about a decade ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Almost to the day. Holy cow. Yes. To the very strange and unusual and unexpected death of Mr. D'Souza. Now, you see, sometimes you're in bed, you're sleeping, you're fine, you're happy, and everything is great. And then a (laughs) fucking cow falls through your roof and kills you. Man, no one expects a Spanish Inquisition, but you really don't expect a cow (laughs) through the roof. Yep. No, you certainly do not. So apparently what happened was this cow had escaped from a nearby farm and then uh, walked onto the roof because it was near a hill. I don't know how, but this cow made it up there. And uh, because you see, cows do not belong on a roof. It fell through. And uh, I will say that the cow was fine. (laughs) Oh, no. And so was his wife who was sleeping next to him. Well, th- thank God for that. <laughs> um, he did not instantly die, though. He fractured his leg and he was taken to the hospital. He died of his injuries. Aww. And uh, yeah, so his mother was quoted. Uh, the Daily Mail interviewed her and she said, I didn't bring my son up to be killed by a falling cow. He nearly died when he was two and got meningitis, but I worked hard to buy medicines for him and he survived. And now he's lying in his bed and gets crushed to death by a cow. There's no justice in this world. (laughs) 
she's very right. She's probably like, for fuck sakes, I raised this man, I gave him love, and now he's dead. Like because by a of cow. a cow. And uh, the owner of the cow uh, at the time that this article was published was not identified, but they uh, they may face charges. So I don't know what happened with that. But that's, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to die. And I feel like that is not a great one. No, you know, when we've talked about the morbid discussion of, you know, like, what's the worst way to go? Or, you know, how do you want to go when your time is up? There's not one person that said, I'd like to be crushed to death by a cow while I sleep and I guess technically not crushed to death either because I think he died of internal bleeding because of his fractured leg yep <laughs> oh man poor Mr. D'Souza rest in peace rest in peace indeed all right so that brings us to the end of this extra credit episode I feel like we needed it after the Robert Hansen series I've been looking forward to this Yeah, it's kind of just nice to chat about things without having to worry about Mr. Robert Hansen roaming the wilds of Alaska. Once again, glad he's gone. We have a palate cleanser coming up for you. We've got some interesting stories we're going to be sharing, so it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome because it's not Robert Hansen, so yay! Yay! But don't worry, we're getting back to something terrible very soon after. Yeah, because that's just kind of the nature of things. We are the grim curriculum after all. And we are keeping it grim. (laughs) All right, everyone. Thank you so, so, so much for listening. This has been the Grim Curriculum. Extra Extra credit. credit.